continuing on to chapter 21. Chapter 21 focuses on leases. There's a lot of misconceptions about leases <clears throat> when it comes to using them from a business perspective. We're going to look at everything from the leasing environment to some very special problems that are the result of accounting for leases. After studying this chapter, you should be able to explain the nature, economic substance, and advantages of lease transactions. Describe the accounting for leases by lessees. Describe the accounting for leases by lessors. So in this chapter, you're gonna be looking at both sides. So it's really important to pay attention to who you are uh, as you're going through the material and working on problems. And then describe the accounting and reporting for some special features of lease arrangements. Many businesses lease substantial portions of the property and equipment they use in their business organizations as an alternative to ownership. Because leasing provides some financing, financial operating and risk advantages over ownership, it has become the fastest growing form of capital investment. This increased significance of lease arrangements in recent years has intensified the need for uniform accounting and complete informative reporting of leasing transactions. This chapter presents a discussion on the accounting issues related to leasing arrangements from the point of view of both the lessee and the lessor. Among the issues is the classification of leases, various methods used for accounting for leases, and the financial statement requirements when leases are present. A lease is a contractual agreement between a lessor and a lessee that gives the lessee the right to use specific property owned by the lessor for a specified period of time. In return for this right, the lessee agrees to make rental payments over the lease term to the lessor. The lessors that own the property include banks, captive lease companies, and independents. The largest group of leased equipment often involves information technology equipment, transportation, construction, and agricultural. <clears throat> Here we're looking at uh, some of the descriptions from 10K filings on companies that lease. Notice that GAP leases most of their store press premises, some of the headquarter facilities, the distribution centers. Exxon Mobil Corp has minimum commitments for operating leases shown on an undiscounted basis uh, to cover drilling equipment, tankers, service stations, and other properties. J.P. Morgan Chase is obligated under a no number of non-cancelable operating leases for premises and equipment that's used for their banking purposes. Uh, many of the largest corporations engage in leasing in some manner or another. For example, Starbucks leases retail stores, roasting and distribution facilities, and office space under operating leases. So who are the players? What, <clears throat> where are the lessors? 55% of them are gonna be banks. About 14% of them are independents. And then 31% of them are capita, captive leasing companies. So these are places like Caterpillar Financial Corp, Ford Motor, uh, IBM Global Financing, they're leasing their specific products, that's why they're captive. In discussing the advantages of leasing arrangements, advocates point out that leasing allows for 100% financing at fixed rates, protection against obsolescence, flexibility, less costly financing, some tax advantages, and potentially off-balance sheet financing.
quite often airlines use lease arrangements. Um, and this is the re results in what's called off balance sheet financing. Uh, airlines at least aircraft understate their debt levels by a substantial amount. Um, but airlines are not the only ones who engage in this. Recent studies of S&P 500 companies show that off balance sheet lease obligations total, or total more than one half trillion dollars or about 3% of the market value. So when analysts are looking at these companies, they have to re adjust the reported debt levels for the effects of these non-capitalized leases. There are a variety of options that exist regarding the manner in which long-term lease arrangements should be accounted for. Uh, there, these opinions range from total capitalization of all long-term leases to the belief that leases represent execute executory contracts that should not be capitalized. FASB requires capitalization of lease arrangements that are similar to those of installment purchases. So basically, lease arrangements that transfer substantially all of the risks and rewards of ownership of property should be capitalized by the lessee. For accounting purposes of the lessee, all leases may be classified as operating leases or capital leases. For a lease to be recorded as capital lease, the lease must be non-cancelable and meet one of the following criteria. The lease transfers ownership of the property to the lessee at the end of the lease. The lease contains a bargain purchase option. The lease term is equal to 75% or more of the estimated economic life of the lease property. And the present value or the present value of the minimum lease payments, excluding executory costs, equals or exceeds 90% of the fair value of the lease property. If the lease meets none of these four criteria, the lease, lease should be classified and accounted for as an operating lease. If the lessee capitalizes a lease, the lessee records an asset and a liability, generally equal to the present value of the rental payments. They'll record the depreciation on the leased asset and treat the leased payments as consisting of interest and principal. Remember, one or more of these four criteria must be met in order for capital lease accounting. This is where we are going to recognize the asset <clears throat> and a liability in our books. Here's a nice little pictograph that will show you what to do and how to determine whether it is a capital lease or an operating lease. And now we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about the criteria. By and large, if ownership is going to, of the asset is going to transfer, it's going to be a capital lease. The bargain purchase option is a provision that allows a lessee to purchase the lease property for a price that is significantly lower than the property's expected fair value at the date the purchase option becomes exercisable. The 75% of economic life test is based on the belief that when a lease period equals or exceeds 75% of the asset's economic life, the risks and rewards of ownership are transferred to the lessee and capitalization is appropriate. 
Lease terms are generally considered to be fixed, and there are non-cancelable terms of the leases usually. There could be a bargain renewal option that could extend the period. And at the inception of the lease, the difference between the renewal rental and the expected fair rental must be great enough to exercise <clears throat> to make exercise of the option to renew reasonably assured. So let's look at Home Depot who leases Dell PCs for two years at a rental of $100 per month per computer and subsequ subsequently can lease them for $10 per month per computer for another two years. The lease clearly offers a bargain renewal option. The lease term is considered to be four years. The reason for the recovery of investment test and 90% is that if the present value of the minimum lease payments are reasonably close to the market price of the asset, the asset is effectively being purchased. A major exception to the 75 and 90% rules is when the inception of the lease occurs during the last 25% of the asset's life. When this occurs, the 75% and the 90% tests should not be used. Under the capital lease method, the leasee <coughs> treats the lease transactions as if an asset's being purchased over time on an installment basis. For a capital lease, the lessee is going to record an asset and liability <clears throat> at the lower of the present value of the minimum lease payments during the term of the lease or the fair value of the leased asset at the inception of the lease. In determining the present value of the minimum lease payments, uh, there are three important factors. One is the minimum lease payments, two is the executory costs, and three is, of course, the discount rate. Minimum lease payments are going to include uh, the minimum rental payments, any guaranteed residual value, penalties for failure to renew or extend the lease, and any bargain purchase options that are in play. Minimum rental payments are the minimum payments the lessee is obligated to make to the lessor under the lease agreement. A residual value is the estimated fair value of the lease property at the end of the lease term. The guaranteed residual value is the certain or determinable amount at which the lessor has the right to require the lessee to purchase the asset, or the amount the lessee or the third party guarantor guarantees the lessor will realize. This allows the lessor to transfer the risk of loss in the fair value of the asset to the lessee. If the lessee guarantees the residual value, the present value of this residual value should be reported as part of the lease liability. If a bargain purchase option exists instead of a guaranteed residual value, the lessee should increase the present value of the minimum lease payments by the present value of the option price. In both the guaranteed residual value and the bargain purchase option cases, the lessee is committed to making these payments and therefore the payments should be reported as an increase to the lease liability. Executory costs include things such as the cost of insurance, maintenance, and tax expenses related to the leased asset. The lessor makes these payments such amounts are not included in the present value of the minimum lease payments. The lessee uses its incremental borrowing rate discount rate to compute the present value of the minimum lease payments. Here comes the time value of money again. This rate is often determinable by the exercise of professional judgment and is defined as the rate that at the inception of the lease, the lessee would have incurred to borrow the funds necessary to buy the leased asset. There is one exception. 
if the lessee knows the implicit rate computed by the lessor, and that rate is less than the lessee's incremental borrowing rate, then the lessee must use this implicit rate. Assets and liabilities are recorded at the lower or the present value of the minimum lease payments, excluding the executory costs, or the fair market value of the leased asset at the inception of the lease. If lease transfers ownership, depreciation over the asset of the asset over its economic life is part is taken the lease does not transfer ownership the depreciation is over the term of the lease when a lessee uses the capital lease method each lease payment is allocated between a reduction of the lease obligation and the interest expense, applying the effective interest method. The lessee should amortize the lease asset by applying one of the conventional depreciation methods. During the term of the lease, assets are recorded under capital leases are separately identified in the lessee's balance sheets. Likewise, the related obligations are separately identified with the portion that's due within one year or the operating cycle, whichever is longer, classified with the current liabilities and then the balance with the non-current liabilities. Here we have an illustration, a Capital Caterpillar Financial Services Corporation, a subsidiary, subsidiary of Caterpillar and Sterling Construction. They sign a lease agreement dated January 1st, 2017 that calls for Caterpillar to lease a front-end loader to Sterling beginning January 1st, 2017. The terms and provisions of the lease agreement and other pertinent data are here as follows. The term of the lease is five years. The lease agreement is non-cancellable, requiring equal rental payments of $25,981.62 at the beginning of each year. That's an annuity due because it's at the beginning. The loader has a fair value at the inception of the lease of $100,000, an estimated economic life of five years, and no residual value. Sterling pays all of the executory costs directly to third parties, except for the property taxes of 2,000 per year which is included as part of its annual payments to Caterpillar. The lease contains no renewal options. The loader reverts to Caterpillar at the termination of the lease. Sterling's incremental borrowing rate is 11% per year. Sterling depreciates on a straight line basis, similar equipment that it owns and Caterpillar sets the annual rental to earn a rate of return on its investment of 10% per year. Sterling is aware of this fact. So what type of lease is this? Let's look at the capitalization uh, criteria. Is there a substantial transfer of ownership? No, it doesn't actually transfer ownership because it will revert back to Caterpillar. Is there a bargain purchase option available? No, there was not. Lease term, is it 75% of the economic life of the lease property? Yes, the lease term is five years, the economic life is five years. It is actually 100% of the economic life of the lease property. And then is the present value of minimum lease payments equal to or greater than 90% of the fair market value of the property? 
The present value is 100,000 and the fair market value is 100,000. We have met two of the criteria for capitalization, therefore this is a capital lease. So we compute the present value of the minimum lease payments. They're $25,981.62 each, uh, of which 2,000 of it is, is, uh, is executory costs. So that makes the minimum lease payment, the portion that is attributable to the lease, $23,981.62. Using a present value factor of uh, 10% for five years, and we're using the 10%, which is Caterpillar's implicit rate rather than the incremental borrowing rate because it is lower and we know what it is. We go to the present value of annuity due table uh, because these payments are at the beginning of the year, not at the end. The present value of the minimum lease payments is $100,000. I know that the time value money is not your favorite thing. Uh, however, it is something that is definitely used throughout accounting and finance and business. So Sterling records the capital lease on its books on January 1st, 2017 as leased equipment under capital leases of $100,000. That's the asset. And then a lease liability of $100,000. They record their first lease payment on January 1st, 2017 as property tax expenses of 2000 Lease liability of $23,981.62 and cash reduction of $25,981.62. <clears throat> we would create an amortization schedule that would show the amount of interest that we would record on the lease liability every year following that first year. Now, no time has gone by uh, with the January 1st, 2017 payment. That's why it all goes to the reduction of the lease liability. Now, on January 1st, 2018, there has been a full year, so there has there is an interest component to take into account. That is why we have uh, interest picking up in that second year. We would follow this particular amortization schedule for all future payments and allocate them appropriately between uh, executory costs, uh, interest, and the reduction of the lease liability for the five-year term. The nice thing about this particular graphic is that you see that it actually tells you how to create this, this spreadsheet for yourself. We then prepare the entry to record the accrued interest on December 31st, 2017. It's been a year of accrued interest, so there's an interest expense of $7,601.84 and interest payable of $7,601.84. We prepare the required December 31st, 2017 depreciation for the year utilizing the straight line method. Remember that is the method that they use for similar equipment that they own. Straight line for 100,000 divided by five years is a depreciation expense to capital leases of 20,000 and accumulated depreciation to capital leases of 20,000. The liability section as relates to lease transactions on December 31st, 2017 would show interest payable of $7,601.84 and a lease liability of $16,379.78 in the current section because that's what's going to be remitted uh, on January 1st. And then additional non-current lease liabilities of 
$638.60 because those are the future year payments. On January 8th, 2018, we would actually remit a payment of $25,981.62. Of that $2,000 of it is going to go to the property tax expenses. $7,601.84 will reduce our interest payable accrual from December 31st, 2017. And then we would have a lease liability reduction of $16,379.78 for the full annual lease payment in cash of $25,981.62. Now the other method that is available is the operating method. And accounting for an operating lease. The lessee uses the operating method. The periodic rent that's associated with the lease is recognized in the period benefited by the leased asset. Under this method, the commitment to make future rental payments is not recognized in any of the accounts. There is only a footnote recognition that is given to the commitment to pay future rentals. The journal entry, the lessee, includes a debit to a rent expense and a credit to cash. So we're going to assume that Sterling accounts for the lease as an operating lease. The payment on January 1st, 2017 would be rent expense of $25,981.62 and cash of $25,981.62. Obviously, accounting for operating leases is much more simple. So it's not unusual that companies in specific industries like to get caught up um, in the accounting rules for operating leases. Getting the accounting right is really important, not just for restaurant chains, but for anybody, uh, because they make extensive use of leases, as we have noticed across the industries. Go back to the criteria and ensure that the various uh, factors are all answers of no before you deem something to be an operating lease. Because some companies had misclassified leases, there had been a res result in restatements of financial statements to correct this error. Uh, anytime you have a restatement, there are consequences, uh, not just from the SEC, but in the market. Uh, analysts lose confidence in those companies uh, when there has been a substantial amount of restatement that has occurred. So let's look at capital leases versus operating leases. While the total charges to operations are the same over the lease term, whether the lease is accounted for as a capital lease or an operating lease. Under the capital lease treatment, the, chain, the charges are higher in the earlier years and lower in the later years. When accelerated method of depreciation is used, the differences between the amounts charged to operations under the two methods is even larger in the earlier um, and later years. The following differences occur if a lease is accounted for as a capital lease instead of an operating lease. There's an increase in the amount of reported debt. Uh, this is gonna be both short-term debt and long-term debt, because remember we classify uh, the portion that is due within the next year as current, uh, the remaining as non-current. An increase in the amount of total assets, specifically the long-lived assets, because we actually recognize the asset as a capital lease on the books and a lower income early in the life of the at lease. Therefore, we're gonna result in lower retained earnings.
Under current accounting rules, companies can keep the obligations associated with their operating leases off the balance sheet. This approach may change depending on FASB's new lease accounting rules. The current plans for a new rule in this area should result in more operating leases on balance sheets. And analysts have estimated the expected impact of the new rule. It actually has just gone through. <clears throat> As shown in the table on the right, if FASB issues a new rule on operating leases, company like Walgreens could see its liabilities jump as much as 216%. What does this do to the ratios of the organization? Uh, what does this do to the perspective that different investors and creditors would have when they're looking at the financial statements? And it's not just retailers who are going to be impacted. There is a JP Morgan study that estimated the following impacts on a variety of uh, industries showing what the leverage is excluding operating leases and then what the company's leverage is including operating leases and some of these are pretty substantial like the difference between retail is pretty real uh, but look at travel and leisure uh, automobile and parts not a huge difference between them uh, construction personal and household goods those have some pretty decent differences between one and the other. So you can see how there might be and there will be a pretty substantial impact from the new rules. We're going to end this particular uh, video at this juncture and then we will come back in the next one and talk about accounting for leases by the lessors. So we've been talking about the person, the lessees, the individuals who pay the money and receive the asset. Now we're going to talk about it from the company that provides the asset and collects the money next.